In the slideshow, I've tried to describe the essence of the variable release threshold hypothesis in the least technical way possible. So hopefully it should be understandable to people who don't have a background in physiology or psycholinguistics. To understand the variable release threshold hypothesis, it's vital to get one thing straight right from the start. And that is that disfluencies are not speech errors. Speech errors are when a wrong or inappropriate sound or word comes out, whereas disfluencies are interruptions to the normal forward flow of speech. And it's possible to make a lot of speech errors and yet at the same time to be completely fluent. And conversely, it's possible to be very disfluent without actually making any speech errors. So throughout the course of this slideshow, try to bear in mind that speech errors are speech errors and disfluencies are disfluencies. Having said that, it's certainly true that speech errors and disfluencies tend to be closely associated with each other. And in particular, people often become disfluent at moments when they're trying to avoid making speech errors. Similarly, stammering involves certain types of disfluencies and people may stammer when they're trying to avoid making speech errors. We'll talk about this in detail later on in the slideshow. Here's one of my favourite cartoons about stammering. It originally accompanied a poem about stammering by Alan Babington. And it sums up particularly well the fact that as stammerers, we don't generally experience any difficulty formulating what we want to say. The problem is being able to get those words out at the moment when we need them. Or to put it more technically, the problem is in, is in being able to release those planned words for motor execution at the moment when we want to do so. The variable release threshold hypothesis provides a simple explanation for why we might experience such problems. It posits that there's a mechanism that stops us from releasing planned words for execution whenever we lack confidence that we'll say the words that we've planned well enough. And we're likely to lack such confidence if in the past we've experienced similar situations where we've tried to say something and our listeners have not responded to what we've said in the way we hoped or expected. When we want to communicate something to someone, before we start to speak, our brains spontaneously create a speech plan, which is a sort of program that contains information that's needed in order to be able to communicate whatever it is that we want to communicate. Speech plans specify which words to use, the order in which those words are to be spoken, the stress and intonation patterns for those words, and the muscle movements required to produce them. Exactly what goes into a speech plan will depend on what it is that we want to communicate and also on the person to whom we're speaking. Our brains are constantly creating speech plans and at any one time there'll be more than one plan being created. It's an automatic process that we're not fully consciously aware of. In the cartoon above, the hedgehog person has evidently created two speech plans, one for muffin please and the other for toast please. It takes time to create a speech plan and some speech plans take longer to create than others. The more time one has, the more strongly electrically activated a speech plan becomes. And importantly, speech plans that are only weakly electric electrically activated are likely to contain errors, whereas speech plans that are strongly activated are less likely to contain errors. In our brains there's also a threshold mechanism that regulates how highly electrically activated a speech plan needs to become before it can be released for motor execution. If you feel strongly motivated to say a word very well without making any speech errors, the threshold mechanism will only allow the speech plan for that word to be released for motor execution after it has become highly electrically activated. 
If, on the other hand, we don't really care how clearly and accurately we speak a word, the release threshold for the speech plan for that word will be set at a lower level. In the cartoon, the hedgehog obviously really wants to ask for a muffin. He doesn't really want toast. But he's worried that he might not be able to say the word muffin well enough for the crocodile to understand him. His strong desire to say muffin as clearly as possible means that the release threshold for the word muffin has become set at too high a level, so his brain has difficulty releasing it for motor execution. In contrast, the release threshold for toast is set at a lower level because he doesn't really care about toast. So ironically, the word toast can be released for motor execution more easily than the word muffin. In this graph, the curved line represents the level of electrical activation of a speech plan for a word. You can see how it rises as time goes on, up to a maximum, and then levels out. The dotted lines represent three different possible settings of the release threshold. The level at which the release threshold is set varies from word to word and goes up and down, depending on how much the speaker feels the need to say that word clearly and accurately. If the speaker doesn't care about a word, the release threshold for that word will be set at a low level and he'll be able to start motor execution of it even when the speech plan is not very highly electrically activated. However, if the speech plan is not highly activated, there's a high likelihood that it will contain errors of one sort or another that will become apparent when the speaker speaks it out loud. If the speaker feels a need to be careful about how he says a word, the release threshold for the plan for that word will be set somewhat higher. He'll have to wait a little longer before he can say it, but when he does, it'll probably, he'll probably say it correctly without any speech errors. If, if the speaker tries too hard to speak a word completely accurately, the release threshold for that word will rise so high that the plan for the word will never become sufficiently electrically activated to enable it to be released for motor execution. As a result, the speaker will find himself unable to say that word. He'll block on it. In the cartoon, the release threshold for the word muffin has become set at too high a level, so the hedgehog finds himself unable to say it. But he can say toast, because the release threshold for the word toast has not been set so high, because he doesn't care so much about toast. If we block on a word, it means that the release threshold for that word is set too high. So in order to reduce the likelihood of blocking on a word, we need to bring its release threshold down to a lower level. One way of doing this is by making less effort to speak it clearly and accurately. It's important to understand this point because by and large, most stammerers tend to put more rather than less effort into clearly speaking the words that they expect to block on. So making less effort on such words means doing the opposite to what you've probably been doing up until now. In order to reduce our tendency to block and to stammer, we need to stop trying to avoid speech errors. And we need to stop worrying about how clearly and accurately we're articulating our words. This is easier said than done, because people who stammer tend to hold a deeply entrenched belief that in order not to stammer, they have to try as hard as they can to articulate potential problem words clearly and accurately. And this false belief tends to be reinforced by traditional approaches to stammering therapy, as well as by society in general. In reality, trying to speak more clearly and accurately actually increases the likelihood of stammering, rather than decreasing it. Having understood this principle, the most straightforward, practical way of reducing the amount of effort that we put into speaking clearly and accurately is to focus our attention on some other aspect of our speech. 
One option is to focus our attention on maintaining the forward flow of our speech. And the more strongly we focus on maintaining the forward flow, the less our attention is pulled towards the accuracy and clarity of our articulation. In other words, in order to pull our attention away from the accuracy of our speech, we need to focus our attention primarily on maintaining fluency, the forward flow. We need to give a higher priority to fluency than to accuracy. So, to summarise, we produce blocks when the release threshold rises too high. In order to reduce the likelihood of blocking, we need to reduce the height of the release threshold. In order to do this, we need to try less hard to speak the problem words clearly and accurately. In order to try to, uh, in order to try less hard to speak these words clearly and accurately, we need to give a higher priority to simply maintaining the forward flow of speech. And in order for all of this to be possible, we need, first of all, a clear understanding of the inverse relationship between errors and disfluencies. Secondly, we need a willingness to abandon trying to speak accurately whenever we become disfluent. And thirdly, we need an overall pragmatic approach to communication. A useful concept to bear in mind when it comes to deciding on a strategy to reduce the release threshold is that of the fluency-accuracy trade-off. In a nutshell, the more effort we put into articulating our words clearly and accurately, the higher the release threshold rises and the more disfluent we become. In contrast, the more effort we put into simply maintaining the forward flow of speech, the more the release threshold tends to fall and the more error-prone we become. Of course, it would be nice if we could be both fluent and accurate, both at the same time. However, because our speech production systems do not function as well as those of people who don't stammer, that's not always possible. So sometimes we need to make a compromise. And by and large, speech errors are less of a problem than disfluencies. Therefore, by focusing simply on maintaining the forward flow of speech without worrying about the accuracy of what comes out, the benefits of the increased fluency that result more than outweigh any negative consequences that may result from the increased number of speech errors that we may actually produce. In my experience, overall, when stammerers stop focusing their attention on articulating each individual word correctly, they may indeed make more speech errors, but more often than not, the listener's easily able to recognise the words that they intended to say. And overall, there's a net improvement in the effectiveness of their communication. Both orchestral speech and the jump increase our focus on the forward flow of speech. Specifically, orchestral speech ensures that we maintain the forward flow whereas the jump enables us to re-establish it when it gets, when it's lost. Both techniques work by reducing the release threshold.